So the, the question just before the, the break was, uh, if we want to do an, an experiment, uh, what would be the, the design of that experiment to, uh, uh, to check the validity of the of stocks uh, estimate of the drug? Okay. So the first thing is to uh, select your fluid. So it has to be a Newtonian fluid, a very simple fluid. Okay. So, so you take uh, water is not very viscous, so it will be very difficult to get very small Reynolds number. Um, so you have to take a, a Newtonian oil, a very viscous oil, okay? You have to take a sphere, of course, because Stokes, Stokes solution is only for a sphere. The analytic solution is, has been only written uh, down for a sphere. So you have to take a perfect sphere if you want to compare with the analytic solution of Stokes, okay? And then you have to, to be sure that the Reynolds number is much lower than one. And I, I told you that because the Reynolds number is proportional to uh, R cube, because it is proportional to R cube, the, the simple way is to decrease the size. Because if you do an experiment, you are not going to change the fluid anytime. It's very you know, time consuming. So the easy way is to take spheres of different diameter, and as you go to smaller diameters, you will reach Reynolds number 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, and so on. And then you will reach more and more uh, accurately the, the stock's drag. But you have to, to, to also take care at one assumption of the solution. This is the assumption that the fluid is unbounded. It's an infinite fluid. Okay, so it means of course, you cannot make an experiment within an infinite fluid. Of course, you, you will have a, a tank with walls. But if you want to compare with this exact solution, you need the wall to be very far <coughs> from the sphere. Okay, and I'm going to give you the, this information. If you look at the, at the flow field, so because the sphere is going down, of course, the fluid is going to move up. And then you have a flow around the sphere. Okay, so you will have a flow. You will have a flow around the sphere. And this flow is, of course, at the position of the particle. It will be of the same order as the infinite because of the no-slip boundary condition on the sphere. So the fluid is moving at this velocity close to the particle. But as you go far from the sphere, of course, the velocity of the fluid will decrease. Okay, So it, it is the infinite at the boundary of the sphere, but as you go far from the sphere, it will decrease, okay? And actually, the rate of decrease is 1 over r, okay? So, v, uh, u, so it's not, let's call it u, so u of the fluid is decreasing like 1 over r if r is a distance, okay? So, it is v infinite, so the perturbation is proportional to V infinite over R. And R is the distance from the sphere. Okay? So what does it mean? It means if the walls of your tank are at one, at 10 radius, then the perturbation will be 1 over 10. So it will be 10%. Okay, so it means if the flow is settling with a tank which is only at 10 radius, the sphere is going to experience the resistance of the wall by 10%. Okay, so it means even if the Reynolds number is very low, if your sphere is very spherical, you will not get the, the estimate of stocks because you have the walls which is going to decrease the settling speed by at least 10%. If you go, if you make a tank which is bigger, let's say it's 100 radius, then you will have 1% error. Okay, you see it is decreasing like 1 over R. It's not very fast. Okay, so the tank, so le let's say that this is R, the radius, and this is L, the tank. If you want to compare, you have to take L 
over r, which is larger than 100. If it's larger than 100, then you may expect, expect an error of less than 1%. Okay? So these are the, the requirements to fill, uh, to, uh, to fill out to get a uh, stocks estimate, and then you will get a good accuracy. And actually, you can find uh, some um, experimental devices that are used to estimate, to measure the viscosity. Because based on that, you see that, let's say you have a system where you have a, part a test particle and you have a camera, then based on the settling, settling of the particle, you can record the trajectory with image analysis. From the trajectory, you can get, by differentiation, you can get the velocity. And if you measure the velocity, you know the size, you know the properties of your fluid, so density of the particle, density of the liquid. So you can measure actually the viscosity. So it's a way of measuring viscosity for Newtonian fluid. It's called the settling sphere viscometer. Okay? So it can be used and it, it is working. So now I'm going to explain uh, what is going on when the Reynolds number is not low. Okay? So I mean by low when it's 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 1, 0.1. 1, 10, 100, 1,000, okay? Of course, as you increase the Reynolds number, the particle is still experiencing a drag. But what is the expression of that drag? Uh, so first, we look at the flow, okay? So these are pictures of an experiment of a flow around a spherical particle, and we look at the wake. So this is as you increase the Reynolds number, and we look at, at the wake behind the particle. So you have to know that when the Reynolds number is very low, actually the flow is symmetric. So this is a sphere. When the Reynolds number is very low, so, of course, the flow is symmetric along the axis of rotation because the sphere is as a, an axis of, ro of rotation. But it is also symmetric. So, the flow is coming from here. But it is also symmetric uh, if you look at uh, the, um, the, uh, the wake and the front of the particle. So the flow is completely symmetric, okay? So you have a fore and aft symmetry of the flow, and it is because the stocks, the stocks equations are linear. So there's no difference between upstream, upstream and downstream. So the flow streamlines are exactly the same, okay? As you will increase the Reynolds number, so the Reynolds number now is lower than one, but it's not much lower than one, just lower than one, then you will lose this symmetry. Okay, so, so you have symmetry. When the Reynolds number is lower than one, but not much lower than one, then you will lose the symmetry between upstream and downstream. Okay, so, and this is what you see here. So you see that now you will, sh you will see the appearance of a wake because of inertia. Okay, inertia is because when you increase the velocity, you increase the, basically the Reynolds number, the particles would like to go in straight line because of inertia. Okay, so this is what inertia is when you, you stop acting on the particle, but still it has, on the fluid particles, but still it has some trajectory, okay, some motion without any forces. So when the Reynolds number is lower than one, then the flow is moving like this, is moving like this, like this, but here you have no symmetry, okay? So it means that if you look at the shape of the streamlines upstream and the shape of the streamlines downstream, they are not exactly the same because inertia is becoming important. And as you further increase the Reynolds number, so when the Reynolds number is order one or larger than one, then this effect is increasing. The effect of inertia, so the particles would like to, 
keep a straight trajectory. The free particles would like to keep a straight trajectory. And because of mass conservation, if the fluid is moving like this, of course, it will come back because of mass conservation. You cannot, you cannot have any void into the liquid. Okay, so the fluid is going to move like this, to move like this, and here you will have, you will have vortices, which are re recirculation zones. And of course, you, you lose completely the, the symmetry, uh, the upstream, downstream symmetry. And then you have a wake. Okay? And this length of the wake, L, is increasing when the Reynolds number is increasing. Because inertia is going to push the fluid in the downstream direction. So this is what you can see here. Okay? So here, this is very low Reynolds number. So the streamlines are touching the surface. You increase the Reynolds number, you see here the appearance of a very, very small wake. So the, you cannot see the Reynolds number, but it's, uh, so it's 0 0.38, 10, 30, 24, something. Uh, and here you see the wake. Okay, so you see the wake, you see the wake again. And here you see the wake very, very distinctly. And this wake, you see the length. As you increase the Reynolds number, the length is increasing. OK, so this is what you can observe if you do an experiment. And what is the effect of that on the drag? Because of course, if the flow is different, you remember that the drag <coughs> force is the integral of the viscous stress plus the, pr the pressure. If the flow is different, the velocity field is different, the pressure field is different. So of course, the integral of wheels or all these stress will be different. So we expect that the force is different. And act actually, it is true. The force is completely different if you compare that situation to that situation. The intensity of the force, the intensity of the force is completely different. So how can we handle this? So we need to make corrections to the Stokes estimate. Okay, Stokes is certain value multiplied by something, which is going to incorporate the effect of the modification of, of the flow of the wake behind the particle. And the way it is done is by defining a drag coefficient. Okay, because for this regime, there is an analytic solution. But as you increase the Reynolds number, in the Navier-Stokes equation, you have to keep the full Navier-Stokes equation. And there's no more analytic solution. The only way to get the drag is by making correlations. So you do experiments. You measure the drag. So for example, you have a sphere on the stick, and you measure the force which is acting on the stick. When you increase the Reynolds number, it means when you increase the velocity of the flow. And then you measure the force for that Reynolds number. And then another Reynolds number, another Reynolds number. You change the fluid, you change the size of the sphere, and you make many points. And at some point, and act, you, you will get the, the force, and you make a correlation. And then you can find, I don't know, thousands of papers which has been done to get all these data points. And based on that, you can make a fee. OK, so the way to incorporate the evolution of the drag as a function of the Reynolds number is by this drag coefficient. OK? The drag force, Fd, is minus Cd, uh, P r square over 2, rho f. And then we have, let's say, v square. OK, so we assume that u is 0 or the opposite v or u is the same. OK? And let's say that now we are in the regime where the Reynolds number is much lower than 1. So I want to. to, to to obtain the drag coefficient for the Stokes drag that I know analytically. Okay, so I know that in that case, Fd is minus 6p mu rv. Okay, and it should be equal to minus Cd p 
r square over 2 rho f b square. Okay, so this is the definition. And do you understand why we, we, we take this definition? So why I decide to write the drag force like this? What would be the, the meaning of that? So CD, CD is dimensionless. Okay, so it means it's only a scalar. So the idea of this scaling is that you want to build a dimensionless number, which is a measure of your, of your drag. So CD is the drag force divided by PR square over 2. So uh, let's say uh, uh, rho F V square. And, and this is actually the flux of kinetic energy. So the idea of this scaling to define what is a, called the drag coefficient is to say that the drag, the, the force which is acting due to the flow, must be proportional at some constant to the flux of kinetic energy. You see rho f v square over 2, one half of the v square is the, the kinetic energy. And p r square, if you take the sphere like this, so p r square is the cross-section of your sphere. So it's actually the flux of kinetic energy, which is passing through a section equivalent to the cross-section of your sphere. Okay, so the idea of v-scaling is to try to compare the drag force, the actual, the real drag force, to the flux of kinetic energy. Okay, so in the case of uh, low Reynolds number, so we can evaluate what is CD. Okay, so we can make simple calculation. Uh, pi, pi, r, r square, v, uh, v square. Okay, so finally, uh, so the, also the plus here. So CD, so you see, I just take everything on the left side. So CD will be 6 mu, 6 mu divided by uh, R, so rho F, R, rho F, R, V. And then we have 2 above. Okay, so you see we have 12, we have V, uh, R, and then we have rho F, mu. Okay, so this is what we get. And I would like to compare that with the Reynolds number. You remember the Reynolds number is V, 2R, mu, over rho, mu over rho f, okay? So you see that I have to take 2 here, so that will be 24. And you see that I have v, 2r, mu over rho f, so this is the Reynolds number. Okay, so you can show analytically that when you are in the Stokes regime, the definition of the drag coefficient must go like 24 over the Reynolds number. So this is the, uh, the Stokes drag with that expression, that definition of the drag force. Okay? So it means if you do an experiment and you plot the drag force, so actually what you do, you, you have a sphere, you uh, know the radius, you increase the speed, you measure the Reynolds number because you know the speed, you know the viscosity of the fluid, you know the size, you measure the force, you make the force dimensionless by this quantity, which is the flux of kinetic energy, and then you have access to the drag coefficient. And then if you plot the drag coefficient as a function of the Reynolds number, when the Reynolds number is low, you will reach 
uh, a scaling which is 24 over the Reynolds number. So it means if you plot your points, you must collapse your data points on that analytic expression. And as you increase the Reynolds number, you will see deviation from this stocks estimate. Okay, so you see that, for example, here, so the stocks will be, the, the drag will be changing, and at some point, you see that the drag coefficient is constant, and at very high Reynolds number, there's a, there's a drop in the, in the experiments. So actually, this is what you get. So you can find many, many, many pictures of that. Okay, so these are pictures with experiments. These are some other pictures. Okay, so if you do experiments like this, you see that you, you have 24 over the Reynolds number, and then you have some correction, and at some point, you see that you have a constant drag coefficient, which is around 0.44. Okay, so when the Reynolds number is high, uh, larger than, you see, 1,000, the drag coefficient is almost constant. Okay, so we are going to explain what is the, the meaning of that. So if I plot CD as a function of the Reynolds number, when it's below, uh, so you cannot see it, but if I move, if I move that, so you see that when the Reynolds number is below, let's say, one or point one, then we get the twenty-four over Reynolds number. let's say when it is below 0.1, okay? Very, very low Reynolds number. So this, this is something that you cannot uh, evaluate, okay? Because stocks has derived the stocks drag for zero Reynolds number, but it has to be much smaller than one, but you don't know if it's 10 to the minus three, minus two, minus one. So actually by doing experiments, you can see, you can observe that the stocks estimate is good up to Reynolds number 0.1, okay? So you can use it when the Reynolds number is below 0.1. When it's above 0.1 and between 0.1 and let's say one or two, then there will be a correction. So it means the stocks is almost the stocks drag plus an additive term. And this additive term is called the Ozin correction. So you see it's 24 over Reynolds number multiplied by one multiplied by something which is increasing like the Reynolds number. Okay, so this is what is called the Ozin correction. So it is 24 over the Reynolds number. One plus multiplied by the Reynolds number. So of course, you see that if Reynolds number is 10 to the minus six, the correction is nothing compared to one. But if Reynolds number is one, uh, 3 over 16 is 0.02, uh, so you will get 2% correction. If Reynolds number is 5, that will give you 10% correction, and, and so on, okay? So this is valid up to, let's say, Reynolds, this is valid up to Reynolds 10. Okay? And, and, and this has been obtained theoretically as well. So you see three over 16 is not a, it's not a correlation. It's something which has been done by theory. And then when you increase the Reynolds number, you will get points, okay? So you have here 24 over Reynolds number, one plus 316 of Reynolds. And then you will get many points like this, okay? Many points due to many experiments. And one of the very classic Correlation is that one. It has been proposed by Schiller and Oman like 30 years ago. And it's a, only a fit of many data points. Okay, so you see how it is built. It is the stocks drag, 24 over the Reynolds number, one plus a correction. 
And this correction is only a fit because you see 0 0.15, 0 0.687 is only a fit. Okay, so you may find different correlations, but all of them have the same structure because what we want is when the Reynolds number is becoming very low, that is Reynolds number is decreasing, that the correction is becoming very small, and then we recover the stocks estimate at small Reynolds number. So this is always the, the way to build the correlation is to make correction to the stocks drag. Okay, so this is valid up to Reynolds equal to 800 around here, because after when the Reynolds number is above that value, you see that the drag coefficient is almost constant. Okay, so when you are in this regime, so from eight, 800 to, let's say you see 10 to the 5, which is very large, <laughs> 10 to the 5, here you have CD equal to 0 0.44. It's almost a constant. And it means that the drag force, okay, FD, which is minus CD PR square over 2 rho F uh, V square. And this is becoming a constant. Okay? Over that, over that range, between 800 and, and 10 to the 5. And this is actually the, the, the reason why the people decided to build the drag coefficient as a dimensionless measure of the drag force by the kinetic energy. It is because they observed that there is a regime, it's called the Newton regime, when the, uh, for, which the Reynolds number, the, for which the drag coefficient is constant. So it means that in that regime, the drag is driven by, only by inertia, by the, kinetic, the flux of kinetic energy. Okay? And this is why they decided to, to, to do this scaling, because they observed that. Okay, above, you, there is a transition to turbulence uh, in, in, the, in the boundary layer. So usually in all the applications you will uh, be uh, uh, in touch, you are not going to reach that big values of the Reynolds number. 10 to the 5 is really strong, strong, very strong flow. Okay? So, but all these, so you see, we have three regimes, stocks, the Schiller, and, uh, uh, so stocks below 0.1, and then you have correlations like Schiller and Nomad, but I told you, you can, I can give you references where you can find, you know, the, um, I don't know, thousands of correlations, and, and all of them are slightly different, where they might be maybe more valid between 10 and 50 between 100 and 200, so you may find many fits, but it's only correlations, okay? There's no theoretical uh, uh, derivation behind. And then there is a regime where, for which the drag coefficient is constant. So the question is now, how can we use this information to evaluate the settling speed? Because of course, in gravity settler, the, the important point is to evaluate the settling speed of the sphere. So we did that for stocks. So we are going to do that for another regime, which is the Newton regime. Because for that regime, we also have an analytic expression of the settling speed. Did you do that already with uh, Professor Majumdar? No? You did on only the stocks? Stocks, okay. Okay, so, so we know that when the Reynolds number is very low, so this is tox, and V infinite is 2 over 9 rho P minus rho F R square over mu G. Okay, so this is uh, 2 over 9 R square, okay. So now I'm going to do the same, but when the Reynolds number is above 800 and below 10 to the 5. So I'm going to do that for, for that regime. Okay, so CD is 
44. So I have to balance. I have to balance buoyancy and drag, okay? Because I I want to give I want to obtain the settling speed, okay? So the infinite will be the balance coming from the buoyancy, rho p minus rho f g, and the drag coefficient and cd. So I'm just going to take the absolute value. CD, PR square over 2, rho f, v square. Okay? And you see that this is quite simple here because this is a constant. Okay? So I just have to take, so everything is constant. This is a constant, this is a constant, so I can have v infinite very simply. So V infinite is divided by CD P R square over two rho F. Okay, everything is constant and I have to take the square root. Okay, so I can do some simplification. So pi r square, uh, and I can have two. So that would be uh, two. That eight third rho p minus rho f uh, r g. over CD, and CD is a constant, so I can write its value, so it's 0 0.44, 0 0.44, uh, and rho, rho f. One half, okay? And you see that this is an, an analytic expression that I can obtain very simply because Rho p, rho f, I know, it's the particle and, and free density. The radius of the particle, I know. G, I know. Density, I know. Okay? So we have two analytic expressions of the settling speed. This one is for the stocks, and this one is called the Newton Newton regime. Okay? So what you can observe is the infinite is proportional to r square. In that case, the infinite is proportional to r to the power one half. So you see that the, the rate of variation when you decrease the size will be completely different. One is r square, the other one is r square root of r. Okay, so you see that the rate of variation is completely different. If you if you divide by ten here the settling speed will be divided by 100. If you divide by 10 here, it will be divided by the square root of 10, which is not much, okay? It's probably around, I don't know, three, three something, three point something, okay? So instead of 100, it's three point something. So you see that the rate of variation as a function of R is different because the, the scaling, the way the drag is evolving as a function of the Reynolds number is different. And these are the two only, uh, analytic expression of the settling speed that you can get. Because when you are in between, when you are in between low Reynolds and let's say high Reynolds, when you are between point, between 1 or 10 and 800, you have to use that correlation. But when you use that correlation, you cannot solve it analytically. Do you understand why? Because now CD, is a function of the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number, you have infinite inside, you have V infinite inside, and you have V infinite at the power 0.687 divided by something. So there is no analytic expression. If you want to estimate the settling speed, you have to solve a nonlinear scalar equation. It's not very complex, but you cannot make it on your paper sheet. 
you have to use a computer, you have to do, you have to do something, okay? <coughs> so the, the general formulation, so this is clear. Uh, yeah? What is the significance of constant uh, <coughs> Any significance of the Newton region? Why is it constant? Uh, the, the physical reason is because when you increase inertia, at some point, everything will be driven by inertia. And, and you know that when the Reynolds number is very high, uh, you can convert the kinetic energy into pressure. This is what is called the Bernoulli equation. You know Bernoulli equation where you have P, uh, um, uh, kinetic energy, and gravity. So here we don't have any gravity because the, the object is small. So you can convert all the kinetic energy into pressure. So when the Reynolds number is very high, actually the drag is only driven by the difference of pressure in upstream and downstream. And because it is, uh, the, the, because as I told you, the, 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 the drag is always the sum of viscous stress and uh, pressure. When you are at ro low Reynolds number, the balance between these two is about, it's one, two, three. Okay, so you have one third for the viscous stress, two thirds for the pressure. As you increase the Reynolds number, because the flow beco is becoming <laughs> non-symmetric, the pressure on the upstream is increasing and the pressure on the downstream is decreasing. So you see that you are pushing on the, you are pushing on the sphere. So the flow is coming here. So the pressure here at the impact is increasing and the pressure in the wake is decreasing. So you see that you push on the sphere and this is going to give you the drag. When you are at high Reynolds number, because of the Bernoulli equation, you can transform all the kinetic energy which is going to impact on the sphere as a pressure contribution. And then, because the scaling that, you, that we decided is to say that the drag is proportional to the kinetic energy, when you can convert all the kinetic energy into pressure, then the drag coefficient is constant. This is the physical meaning. It means that all the kinetic energy has been converted into pressure, which is going to give you the drag. And the viscous stress is almost nothing. And this is why when you, uh, you think about cars, okay, so the Reynolds number for a car is very, is very high. So actually, I don't know, we can estimate that, but if, if your speed is, uh, let's say, um, 50, uh, let's say 20 meters per second. Okay, so that should be around uh, 70 kilometers per hour or something like that. So 20, so we can try to estimate that. Okay, so, so let's say we take a, a car. Okay, so we take a car and the velocity is about 20 meter per second. So of course it's not a sphere. But I told you we can take something which is equivalent to a sphere. So let's say that the size which is important is about, I don't know, two meters, one meters, okay. Let's say for two meters, okay. This is the equivalent uh, radius or diameter of your sphere. So now we can estimate the Reynolds number. So it is 20 by 2 divided by the viscosity of air, it's 10 to, the 10 to the minus 5. Okay, so you see that the Reynolds number of that is, is very, very high. Okay, so it's uh, 10 to the 6, something like this. Okay, so the Reynolds number is very high. So it means that for a car, you will be in, 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 in that regime. And when the people, uh, the, the, the manufacturer are trying to improve the efficiency, the performance of the car, what, what do they do? They try to change the shape. Okay? They are not going to look at the viscous stress. They don't care about the viscous stress because actually the drag is controlled by the pressure and the pressure is controlled by the shape. Okay? So this is why they try to optimize what is called the C CD or CX, which is the drag coefficient. They try to optimize the shape to uh, to minimize the, 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 the wake. And because by minimizing the wake, they can try to minimize the, the pressure drop between the front and the back of, of the car. So they don't care about you know, the, the boundary layer and, and, the, and the viscous stress because in that regime, 
it is completely negligible compared to the, to the pressure drag. So in, you see? So this, and this is the physical reason for the constant is because you convert all your kinetic energy into pressure, and the pressure is going to give you the drag. It's co yeah, it's, this is very similar to the inviscid situation, exactly. Yeah, so you are converting this into Bernoulli's equation. Exactly, exactly, exactly. When you are in that regime, when you are in that regime, you are in the regime of Bernoulli equation, which is the inviscid situation. So the viscous stress has no, no, almost no effect on the drug. No, actually, sir, this uh, Stokes equation you are telling that is the analytical expression approximation of the Navier Stokes. Mm -hmm. Bernoulli is also an analytical approximation at this rate. Yeah, exactly, rate. exactly. It's not turbulent because inviscid doesn't mean turbulent. Yes. So the, the, the question was, uh, can we get an estimate, a high Reynolds number estimate of the drag? If you have a, a non-spherical object, yes. If you take a sphere, the problem is that the drag on the sphere is zero at infinite Reynolds number because, uh, because of the, you have symmetry of the pressure dist distribution uh, from upstream and, and downstream. So unfortunately, you cannot estimate the drag force from the inviscid equations because of the shape, the, sp the specific shape of a particle. If you take a non-spherical particle, then yes, you can have an estimate of the drag, but not for a sphere because it is peculiar. It, the, the, the geometry is very symmetric, and the Bernoulli equation will give you that the pressure in the front will be the same as in the back, so the drag is zero, and it's called the D'Alembert paradox. But okay, so did you? Yeah. Any effect of weight length? something of what weight length weight ah oh, yes yes what is that what, how does it affect here you see the on uh, during all these evolution from let's say 10 to 1000 yes. the, the the effect of the length of the wake is going to increase the the the, the, the correction here you see here as as you increase the Reynolds number, you will increase that correction. And as you will increase the Reynolds number, you will increase the length of your wake. So it is inside this effect. But there's no uh, analytic, there's no theoretical estimate of that. This is an observation. You, you observe that as you increase the Reynolds number, you increase the length of the wake, and then you change the drag coefficient because you have the pressure which is lower in the wake. Okay, so uh, th the last point I would like to show you is that you cannot get the analytic expression in between. So you have two, two analytic solutions. Okay, so one is stocks. Okay, so this is something that we did. The other one is Newton. So this one is proportional to r square. This one is proportional to r one half. Okay. Okay. So this is when the Reynolds number is much lower than one, and this is when the Reynolds number is between eight hundred and ten to the. Uh, yes, 810 to the 5. Okay, but in between, so between, let's say, 10 or 1 uh, and 800,
Okay, so if you write the momentum balance in that regime, okay, so you have buoyancy, you have the drag, and the drag coefficient, now you have to plug this correlation. Okay, and you see that this correlation, you have the Reynolds number, 24 over the Reynolds number, this is the stocks, but you have also 1 plus Reynolds to the power of something. And within the Reynolds, you have the infinite. So you see that here, you have the infinite to the power minus uh, 1. Here you have the infinite to the power 0.687. And here you have the infinite to the power 2. Okay, so you cannot extract from that the infinite analytically. There's no analytic solution for that. Okay, so you cannot write the equation and find, pull out the infinite. You have to solve this nonlinear equation with any numerical method. So you can use MATLAB, you can use, uh, you can make it graphically, you, you do what you want, but you cannot write an expression of the infinite as we did before for Stokes and Newton regime. Okay, so you see, low Reynolds number, there is an analytic expression. High Reynolds number, there is an analytic expression, and in between, you have to write the balance, the momentum balance, and to solve a nonlinear scalar equation. Okay? Okay, so now I'm going to talk about a new effect. Okay, so here I was assuming that the flow that the particle is experiencing is constant. It's a uniform and constant flow. So now I'm going to look at acceleration of the particle. Because, of course, in a turbulent flow, the particle is not going to move with a constant velocity like a settling sphere. It, let's say you have turbulence in the flow, the particle is going to accelerate, to uh, decelerate, to accelerate, decelerate, accelerate, decelerate. And the flow also around, the fluid flow around, might be constant in space, but it will not be constant in time. Okay, so you have also acceleration of the fluid. And this two effects, so acceleration of the particle, acceleration of the fluid, are incorporated into an effect which is called the added mass effect. And I'm going to explain you what is this source of uh, force, okay? So now the, the, we are going to look at acceleration. So you see that this expression, so here you have du by dt, which is the acceleration of the fluid, and dv by dt is the acceleration of the particle. Okay, and it has an effect on the, on the force. You see that here we have actually, you will see that we have two contributions. One is that one, and the other one is what is called the added, added mass effect. So first, we are going to look at uh, the force due to uh, fluid acceleration. So you remember what we did to get the buoyancy. Okay, so to get the buoyancy, uh, I told you that because the fluid is at rest, there is no viscous effect, there's no shear, no stress, viscous stress. So the only uh, contribution to the force is only the pressure. Now we have the flow. We have a flow around the particle which is accelerating because of turbulence. So we have to integrate to get the force. We have to integrate the effect of pressure minus P but also the effect of the viscous stress that I'm writing capital sigma, okay? And it has to be summed over the surface of the particle. There is a theorem, which is called the Gauss or Green theorem, that will uh, allow to transform this surface uh, integration into a volume integration. So P is becoming the gradient of P, and sigma, the, the stress tensor, is becoming the divergence of the stress. Okay, so maybe you are not familiar with that. Uh, if you have any question on, on how to compute the divergence of a, a tensor, I can, I can show you on, uh, on the paper. But theoretically, we know that we are able to do that. Okay? And if you look at the Navier-Stokes equation, actually these two terms are in the Navier-Stokes equation. So if you look at the Navier-Stokes equation,
So if you write the Navier-Stokes equation, rho f du by dt, so this is, it is du by dt with a capital D, means this is the total derivative with temporal evolution and convective evolution. It is minus the gradient of p plus mu Laplacian of u plus rho f g, okay? And this term is actually the divergence of sigma. Okay, so when you, I don't know with uh, Professor Chakraborty if you have seen how to obtain the Navier-Stokes equation, but actually it is coming from that expression, the divergence of the stress tensor, which is a viscous, this is a viscous stress tensor. Okay? So you see that in the force balance, in the force which is acting on the particle, I need to evaluate the gradient of P and the divergence of sigma. So actually I have to evaluate these two terms. And you see that these two terms are equal to that term from the Navier-Stokes equation, okay? Because I have the fluid around the particle, I know that there is an equivalent, an equivalency between the gradient of pressure plus the divergence of viscous stress, and this is equal to rho f du by dt. I'm not talking about that because we already account for that, okay? This is, this is the, the buoyancy force. You remember the, the effect of gravity? I already include this effect on the force balance, and this is the Archimedes force, okay? So I'm just, just going to skip that part because it is already in the buoyancy. Okay, so you see that I can now replace minus the gradient of P plus the divergence of sigma by rho f du by dt. And now, and now I can take this out of the volume because I'm going to assume that it is constant at the scale of the particle. So it will be rho f du by dt multiply by the integral of dv, which is the volume of the particle. Okay, so you see that when you have flow acceleration, you will get a force, which is rho f vp multiplied by du by dt. Of course, if there's no flow, this is zero, du by dt. If there's no flow, if u equal to zero, du by dt is zero, u scalar gradient of u is zero. Okay, so it cancels. But if you have acceleration in the flow, like in a turbulent flow, you have acceleration and this term is non-zero, then it will contribute to the force acting on the particle, okay? So this is the first part, Vp rho f du by dt. So this is rho f Vp one multiplied by du by dt. And now I'm going to comment the, the two other terms, this one and that one, okay? Uh, so you cannot see what is written here, that you may see here. And what is written is, this is the total derivative which matches Lagrangian and Eulerian acceleration. So this is a bit subtle, so I don't know what is your, your background in fluid mechanics, but for those of you who knows, uh, these equations, the Navier-Stokes equations, are written in the Eulerian framework. And when we want to predict the trajectory of the particle, we are working in a Lagrangian framework because we are following the particle along the trajectory. But actually there is, a, of course, an equivalency between the two. The acceleration of the particle, of the fluid particle, into the Eulerian framework must be the same as the acceleration of the fluid particle into the Lagrangian framework. And this is what is told, what, is, what, what this equation says. It says that 
the total derivative in the Eulerian formulation must be one contribution to the Lagrangian acceleration of the particle. Okay, so it's a bit subtle. If you don't understand, you skip that part. So now we are going to talk about the acceleration of the particle. Okay, so and this effect is actually very simple to understand physically. You are not going to understand the math. We don't care. I, I have to give it because you, you have to see that it's not just going from out of my brain. That's equation. Even if you don't understand the equation, it's not a big deal. But you can understand the physics. So the physics is... Let's say I want, to, I want to accelerate my hand. I, I assume it's a particle. Okay? I want to accelerate, so I want to, to start at zero velocity, and I want to reach a certain velocity. So I want to do acceleration like this. So you see, if I do that in, in gas, in air, it's very simple for me. The, the force, I have to counterbalance the effect of the gas around my hand. And to do the acceleration like this, it's very easy. If you do the same experiment in water, when you are swimming, for example, you see that the force is completely different. Okay? So if you want to do this acceleration in gas or in liquid, it's totally different. And that's actually a factor 1,000. And the factor 1,000 is the ratio of density. Gas density or liquid density, there's, there is a factor 1,000. Because when you want to accelerate your hand like this, of course, you have to accelerate the mass of my fist. But you have also to accelerate to the fluid which is around, because the fluid is the gas is moving with my hand. And if I have to accelerate the gas which is around, it is proportional to the density of gas, which is very less. If I do the same experiment in, in the liquid, in water, I have to accelerate also the fluid which is around my hand. But then the density is much higher, so it's much more difficult. So this is what is the force which is called added mass effect. It's like if you have to accelerate the mass of your hand, which is constant in gas or in liquid, but you have also to accelerate a certain volume of fluid which is around. So it could be gas, it could be liquid. If it's gas, it's very easy. If it's li liquid, it's very, very difficult because the mass of liquid is very high. Okay. So this is what the f this equation is telling you. So we have some mismatch in my slides. Sorry. So this is CM. OK. So this is what, the f what this force is telling you. So you see that the added mass force is proportional to the fluid density multiplied by the acceleration. Okay, of course, it, if I have to accelerate very strongly, it will be even more difficult. But it, what is important is to see that this is proportional to the density of the fluid. It could be a gas, it could be a, a liquid, but it is proportional to the density of the surrounding fluid. Okay? So the way to obtain this equation is a bit complex. You, you, are, you have to do some math. But the idea is to use the flow solution around the particle when it is accelerating. And then from that, so this is the flow solution around the particle. And from that, you get the pressure. And from the pressure, you get the force. Okay? And for that, there is an analytic expression at very high Reynolds number, as you said, with the, uh, the potential uh, theory for inviscid fluids with a Bernoulli equation. There's, there is also an analytic expression at very low Reynolds number for Stokes equation. And both of them are going to give you the same answer. So it means that the force you need to accelerate your hand is one half of the fluid mass. Okay, so what I mean by one half is the mass of your particle is density multiplied by volume, density of the particle multiplied by volume, and you have to sum to add to that a contribution which is one half of the volume multiplied by the density of the surrounding fluid. Okay? So this is why we call it added mass. It's like if your mass is taking part of the surrounding liquid, but only one half, one half of the volume. Okay? So this is the force that you can, so you can get it analytically at high Reynolds number, low Reynolds number, 
and it tells you that the, the force you need to accelerate your particle is mp dv dt plus cm, which is a coefficient and it's one half for a sphere. For my fist, it would be slightly different. It would be maybe 0.6 or 0.65, I don't know. For a sphere, it is exactly one half. So it's cm, which is one half for a sphere, multiplied by mf, and mf is the volume of your particle multiplied by the density of the fluid. And you see th that it is completely different. Let's say that you have a solid particle here. Solid particle, you have density, let's say, 2.5, okay, for sand. 2.5. If you have water here, density is 1. So 1 compared to 2.5, you have to account for that. Because one, you, instead of 2.5, you will have 3.5. If you do um, particles in air, this would be 2, uh, 2,000, but that would be only 1. So 1 compared to 2,000, it's nothing. So this is why when you have to accelerate a particle in a gas, the added mass effect is really nothing. It's very, very less, very small. But if you do the opposite, let's say you want to accelerate a bubble in a liquid. The density of your particle, it's a gas, so it's only 1. But the density of the liquid is 1,000. So you see that all the acceleration, all the force which is required for accelerating a bubble is coming from the mass of the liquid around and not from the mass of the bubble because the mass, a bubble is almost massless. Okay, so you see that in the added mass effect, you have three regimes. Gas in a liquid, bubbles in the liquid, added mass effect is very important because all the mass is in the surrounding liquid. Added mass effect is very important. If you have particles in a, li in a liquid or droplets, oil droplets in a liquid, density is almost one. So you have to account also for the added mass because you, you compare one with two, 2.5, 0.8 with 0.8 for oil with 1.2, I don't know, okay? But they are of the same range. So you have to account for that. If you have particles in a gas, density of particles will be few thousands, okay, 2,000, 5,000. If you take iron, it will be 7,000 compared to gas density, which is only one. And then it is not important. Okay, so as, as a summary, we can say that the added mass effect <coughs> added mass, so we have three regime, so uh, bubbles, rho p much lower than rho f added mass dominates. Uh, particles or drops in liquids rho p and, and, and rho f are equivalent, you see? 1, 1 2, 0 0.8, 2.5, same order of magnitude. Added mass uh, uh, is uh, useful. Okay, so you have to account. It's not. It's, it's, a, it's a correction. It's a, it's important. Okay, and then if you have particles <coughs> particle drops in gas, so let's say in air, then rho p is much higher than rho f, then added mass is added mass will be very, very small, so you can neglect this effect. Okay, so 
probably in your applications, you have to deal with bubbles, particles, drops in liquid or gas. So depending on what, uh, on which density ratio you get, because you see that everything is controlled by the density ratio, rho p over rho f. If it's very small, if it's of order one, or if it's very large, you have to account or not of the added mass effect. Okay, so everything is driven by rho p over rho f. I call it rho star. If it's much lower than one, added mass is dominating. Other one, added mass is one effect, is important, but not dri driving the, the whole thing. And if rho star is much lower than one, then you can neglect the added mass effect. Okay? So, um, now we have to, to look at the equation and see what we can do with the equation. So we have mp dv by dt so we have the drag Um, and then we have the added mass effect. So you see that we can sum up the two effects. So we have this, this term, and we have that term, okay, due to acceleration of the fluid and due to acceleration of the particle. So we can sum up these two terms into this equation. So Cm is a constant, so it will be one half for a sphere. If you take a different shape, it will be slightly different. And we have, uh, sorry, so one VP, one plus CM. Okay, so you see that I can take that term and that term together because don't forget what we aim to do. We aim to get the acceleration of the particle, dv by dt. And you see that dv by dt is in the force balance. So we are going to pull it out and to group with that term. So that will be mp plus CM MF DV by DT equal to rho P minus rho F VP G. Okay, so M MP is rho P VP, MF is rho f vp and we have the drag td d r square over 2 okay plus mf uh, <coughs> multiplied by 1 plus cm du by dt. Okay, so this is all what we get. You see that I just took that out, cm, mf, cm, mf is now on the left hand side because what we want to evaluate is dv by dt. Okay, so I take everything on the left side related to dv by dt and I have buoyancy, drag, and the added mass effect. Okay, and you see that if mf is much lower than 
MP, then you will cancel that. If MP is much lower than MF, then you will cancel that. Okay? And that will account for now unsteady evolution of the flow. Okay, so you see we have no flow, constant flow, and homogeneous, and here we have non-constant flow. Okay, so you see that we sum up the different contribution. So now I'm going to talk about the effect of shear. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about the effect of shear because we said that the flow, the different Ex uh, the expansion we can make as a Taylor expansion, we have no flow, constant flow, constant, but with acceleration, and now shear flow. Okay, so now I'm going to look at what is the effect of a shear on the particle. Okay, and the presence of the shear will be to generate a force which is orthogonal, perpendicular to the motion of the particle. And this is very specific because the drag, when you have a particle which is moving like this, the drag is in the same direction as the motion. Compared to the lift, the lift force is a force which is perpendicular to the motion. Okay, so this is something that you know when you play tennis on, or when you play football. You know that the trajectory of the particle, you can change the shape of the trajectory by spinning the particle. Okay, so this is an effect due to the lift. And this force is going to lift up or to push down the particle because of the rotation. So it could be the rotation of the particle itself or the rotation of the fluid which is around. It also generates a lift force. Okay, and this is the expression that we get. Here, the lift force, you see, is an expression with a, a coefficient, like the drag coefficient, but it's a lift coefficient. So you, you can have analytic expression at low Reynolds number, so you can find theory about that, but most of them are correlation, so it's a lift coefficient, like a drag coefficient, multiplied by rho f, the volume of the particle, and you see that here we have the cross product of v minus u, which is the slip velocity, the motion of the particle, by omega, which is the rate of rotation of the fluid. It's the vorticity, okay? So it's a curl of the, of the velocity. And th this is going to give you a force which is perpendicular to the flow. Okay, so you see the mean flow is like this, but because you have a shear like that, you will get a force acting perpendicular to the motion of the particle. Okay, and the, the, again, the expression, the, the maths are a bit complex, but to understand the physics is very simple. You see that here, below the particle, the flow is less because of the shear. Above the particle, the, the, the flow is uh, um, faster because of the shear, because of uh, Bernoulli equation, where you get low velocity, you have high pressure. Here you have high velocity, you have low pressure. So you see that the pressure below the particle is uh, smaller than above the particle, so it will push the particle in that direction. So this is the effect, the effect of the lift force. Okay? And the last slide before the, the break, you get exactly the same effect if you have the fluid which is rotating, then it will generate a lift due to the gradient of velocity. But if the sphere is spinning, and this is what you did for the tennis or with the, the soccer, if the sphere is spinning, again, this is the same effect. You have the sphere which is spinning, the fluid which is passing through, you see here, because of the spinning, it will reduce the velocity. Here, because of the spinning, it will accelerate the velocity high velocity, low pressure, low velocity, high pressure, then you will push the particle upward, okay? So this is what you do when you want to, uh, when you, you do like this with the tennis, so the particle trajectory is moving like that. If you move it like this, you're rotating, rotating like this, pressure low, uh, pressure high, pressure low, it will push the particle downward, okay? So if you lift like this, the, the, for the tennis, it will go down, okay? So this is the, the lift, the lift contribution, which has this expression, and then we have complete the force balance. 